Well, if you're like me, um, videos like that are simultaneously hard to watch, but also so good to watch. And I'm so glad to be part of a church family that wants to be part of serving the world. So thank you for your generosity and for caring enough to watch and be a part of videos like that. Well, a few weeks ago, I was uh, sitting at a local Starbucks coffee shop, sipping on my tall mocha, which is my favorite. And I was working on a sermon, I think, and I happened to overhear a conversation happening at a table nearby. I wasn't trying to eavesdrop and listen in, so I'm not, you know, that creepy guy, but I couldn't help. I just overheard a conversation. Two 20-something guys are sitting just a few feet away, and this is the small part of the conversation I heard, this one line. One guy said to the other, I'm not really sure if there's a God or not, but I know I'll be in heaven. Now, I'm going to let that sink in for a minute. What he said was, I'm not really sure there's a God, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to be in heaven. Now, at first I didn't think I heard him correctly, but when it finally dawned on me that that's exactly what he said, um, I wanted to push, to scoot my chair aside, walk over to his table and say, excuse me, uh, I don't know who you are, but I can't let you say that. It makes no sense. That would be weird, so I didn't do that. But the truth is, what that young man said is characteristic of a huge swaths of our culture today. That what his confusion was is what the confusion is of millions of people who live right here in our culture. A few years ago, I came across a survey by USA Today that found that while only 67% of Americans believed in a literal hell, 88% of Americans believed they would, excuse me, a literal heaven, 88% of people believed that they would be there. In other words, more people believe they're going to be in heaven than believe there actually is a heaven. So what do we believe about heaven and why does it matter? Now we're continuing today our series from the New Testament letter to the Hebrews in a series called Jesus is Greater Than. And as you remember, the letter is written to Jewish background people living at the latter half of the first century and they're in a time of serious, intense suffering and persecution. So the author is writing this letter to encourage them to hang on to their faith in Jesus. Not to go back to their old ways, their old beliefs, but to hang on to Jesus because he is greater. He's greater than all the prophets that came before, greater than the angels, and because Jesus came to offer himself as the final sacrifice, as our greater high priest, and because he did those things for us, no matter how far we've been from God, no matter how long we've walked away from him, we can draw near to God with confidence because of what Jesus has done for us, because he saves to the uttermost. And we've been over that for the last eight weeks or so. Now today we look at the result of our salvation. The result in chapter eight of Hebrews, the author summarizes much of what we learned so far in the first two verses. He says, now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent, the Lord set up, not man. Now, what he's saying here simply is that Jesus is our better high priest who made a better sacrifice by offering up his own blood as the propitiation, remember that complicated word, as the covering for our sins. Now notice, all this is taking place in what the author calls heaven. He says, in the true tent. Now, what we need to see he is saying here is that the heaven is a real place. It's a spiritual place, but it's a real place. And all the temple and its sacrifices are just a picture of the real thing that's taking place even now in heaven. Now, jumping all the way ahead to chapter 9, verse 15, we read this. Therefore, he, Jesus, is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now, this is new. This is the first time he's introduced this thought of an eternal inheritance. Since a death has occurred, that's the death of Jesus, that redeems them from transgressions committed under the first covenant or under the law. And then the author moves to the passage I want to spend time on today. Hebrews chapter 9, beginning in verse 26. But as it is, he, Jesus, has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That is, the blood of animals no longer needed because the blood of Christ is the final sacrifice for our sins. 
Verse 27, and just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, because he already did that, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Now, there is a ton of stuff in these couple of verses. Four certainties we're going to look at today. First, the certainty of death. The certainty of death. Now, I brought this hourglass with me today just to do that. And from the moment I turn that hourglass over, some of you will watch it on and off throughout the rest of the message. Because there's something about an hourglass that just demands our attention. You're wondering, now what's the hourglass for? How long is it going to take for the sand to run out? Is he timing a sermon? Is that how it's going to take? How, that looks long, that looks short, what, I don't know how it is. But it creates tension because we know eventually that sand is going to run out, Right? In the same way, an hourglass is a powerful visual reminder of something we really don't like to think about or talk about very often. And that truth is, our lives, like the sand in an hourglass, are running out. Minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, like sand through an hourglass. Even though our culture invests billions of dollars every year in the attempt to slow down the aging process... We still haven't found a way to defeat death. Now, the Bible teaches that death is a result of sin, and that happened way back in Genesis at the beginning of the Bible. And therefore, death is the enemy of God. The gospel tells us Jesus conquered sin and death through his own death and resurrection and will ultimately destroy death at the end of all things. That happens at the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation. But for now, and for all human beings, death is inevitable. He says, it is appointed for man to die once. Now, why in the world would the author of the letter to the Hebrews say this very obvious thing? It's appointed the man to die once. Well, I think probably for two reasons. First, because the people he was writing to were facing death. Some of them may have believed that by putting their faith in Jesus, they would not die, that he was going to rescue them and keep them from death. But they're seeing death happen to their loved ones. But secondly, because from the very ancient time in the world's history to all, all the way to today, many religions and philosophies teach some form of reincarnation. That is, following physical death, we are reborn into another existence in a different physical body, sort of a metaphysical do-over. In fact, in new data released by the Pew Forum on Re Religion and Public Life, we, they have found that up to 25% of Americans today believe in some form of reincarnation. The author of Hebrews wants his readers to know, and us, that death is certain. God has ordained that human beings only die once. He wants them to know there's something worse than physical death, and that's being unprepared for death when it comes. So now he moves from the certainty of death to the certainty of judgment. The certainty of judgment. When I was in third grade, and if, you're, uh, if you come to team, you're a guy, you come to team on Friday mornings, you heard this story this past Friday. But when I was in third grade, my little grade school had a rule, hard and fast rule, no talking between classes when you had to move out of your classroom, and especially no talking in the bathrooms. I don't know why it was a rule, but it was a rule. And they had these big, mean, scary sixth graders who were hall monitors. They'd wear the, the yellow vests and stuff, and they were hall monitors, and they were scary sixth graders, you know, shaved and stuff. They all looked like Jeff. They were just big... <laughs> Scary guys. And so, but one day, uh, I, I had to go to the bathroom, so I asked my teacher. She gave me a pass to go to the boys' room. So I went to the boys' room, and one of my buddies was in there from another class. And, <laughs> and there was no monitor for some reason. No monitor in the boys' room. And so we obviously enjoyed our newfound freedom, and we started talking and goofing off in the boys' room. And then out of nowhere, this monitor steps out. He must have been in a stall or something. Big sixth grader monitor, and we were in trouble. So we shot out of that bathroom. He headed to his class. I headed to mine. We thought by splitting up, he wouldn't be able to track us both. So we ran back to our classes, ran to my seat, and sat down, hoping that maybe he didn't get a good look at me. Maybe he chased the other kid. So about 15 minutes later, I'm, I'm sitting at my desk, nervous this whole time, and the door opens. Just when I thought I was in the clear, this same kid, the hall monitor, walks in. He walks, he looks, he scans the class, and I'm hiding behind the girl in front of me. And he goes to the teacher. They chat for a minute. They stand up. They're looking back, scanning the class. And I'm hiding. I'm, I'm, I'm like, drop my pencil. I'm hiding down. 
And then I hear him say, he knows who he is. Busted. And I knew judgment was coming. (laughs) Hebrews says, it's appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Now, most people in our culture, I think, assume that the judgment of God will be like a giant scale, right? That after death, we'll stack up all of our good deeds on one arm of the scale, and God will put all our sins on the other arm of the scale, and then God will sort of weigh them. If the good outweighs the bad, boom, we're in. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Now, there is going to be judgment, because who would want a God that does not judge sin and evil? What kind of God would do that, would not do that? There is judgment. The Bible actually teaches three separate or different kinds of judgment. The first judgment is, I would call, the judgment of salvation. That is, whether or not we are judged to be in Christ. In Hebrews, we've already learned that Jesus is the great and final sacrifice for our sins. That by his blood and his blood only are all the sins on the scale washed away. They're all lifted from the scale because of what Christ did for us. So the first and most important judgment after death is what have you done with Jesus? And then based on that judgment, we go to one of two lines, so to speak, if you read through the New Testament. And the one line will be judgment, further judgment of believers, those of us who are in Christ. Salvation and eternal life are guaranteed at this point, so this judgment is only about the nature of the rewards we will receive once we're in the eternal kingdom of heaven. The Bible talks a lot about rewards based on our faithfulness and our service now. But the other line will be very different. This will be judgment for those who have rejected Christ. This judgment is separation from God or hell. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. Now, the whole point of Hebrews up to this point is to let us know that Jesus, as the greater high priest, has offered the greater sacrifice, and that by his blood, our sins are covered completely. We are saved to the uttermost. Therefore, we do not have to fear the judgment that comes following death. And that leads us to the third thing we need to talk about, and that is the certainty of the second coming of Jesus. The second coming of Jesus. Now, this past week, my wife and I took a little break, and we were up um, vacationing for three days in Maine, of all places. And we were having a dinner at a little restaurant one night. And while we were waiting for our order to come, we saw there was a little stack of, of Trivial Pursuit cards on the table. Remember that little game, Trivial Pursuit? Anybody remember Trivial Pursuit? Well, so we picked up, the, we're waiting for our order, so we picked up the cards. And one of the first ones I picked up had a question on it that was, said, one of the most famous and repeated lines in recent movie history is, I'll be back. What actor said that? Anyone? Of course, Arnold. I'll be back. Bonus question, what movies did he say that in? The Terminators. There were like 13 Terminators, right? But did you know this also happens to be one of the most common promises, one of the great promises in the entire New Testament? Verse 28 says, So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. Not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Whoa, a second time? Some of you are thinking, well, what's what's up with that? This is called the second coming of Christ. Actually, it's one of the most pervasive promises in the entire New Testament. The New Testament talks about Jesus' return 318 times. Let me give you a few examples. Acts chapter 1. After Jesus uh, re- uh, ascends into heaven following the resurrection, we read this. And while they were gazing up into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, angels, and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go. The angels say, He'll be back. In Titus chapter 2, the Apostle Paul writes, For the grace of God has appeared in Christ, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul says, he'll be back. Jesus himself in John chapter 14 said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. Jesus himself says, I'll be back. 
The whole Bible ends with this promise. The second to last verse in the Bible, Je uh, Revelation chapter 22, verse 20. He who testifies to these things, that's Jesus, says, surely I am coming soon. So the Bible teaches that Jesus will one day return. And when he returns, he's going to do three things. And I'm going to summarize here uh, because these each require a whole different sermon to outline all that he means. Three things. When he comes back, he's coming back to save to complete the process and the promise of our eternal salvation. Secondly, he's coming back to judge, to make right all the wrongs and all the evil that's ever taken place. Because again, who wants a God of love that does not judge that was his evil? Jesus will come as the judge. And thirdly, he's coming to rule, to rule over what the Bible calls the new heaven and new earth. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Jesus is coming back, friends. That's a promise. We don't know when, but we know it's a fact. And that leads us to the fourth thing today we see in this text, the certainty of our inheritance. The certainty of our inheritance. I have come to believe uh, that every human being, at least everyone I've met, uh, some way, somehow creates their own, what I would call, theology of heaven. I see it all the time. No matter who dies or how that person's lived or what they believed or didn't believe in their life, the overwhelming assumption of our culture is that people go to heaven when they die right? That's the overwhelming assumption. You hear it all the time. I was uh, doing a little research this week, and I found a website called Thought Catalog. It's just a random website where people blog about their beliefs and their ideas. And this one blog I found was people talking about what they think happens after death. Here's a few examples, just random examples of people typing in what they believe. Daniela says, I think you become another living organism. I would like to choose what happens to me so I can wait for my loved ones to die or become an animal that can check up on loved ones or reincarnate. Michael says, I don't think anything happens, but I'd love to freely roam the universe. Jason, I sort of believe in reincarnation and karma. A guy named Jeff says, since I was dead for 15 minutes back in December, I know exactly what happens. Nothing. It's just like a light switch off. Evidently, Jeff never watched Princess Bride, big difference between mostly dead and all the way dead. Right? <laughs> Jenny says, since no one sends letters or information after death, I believe that's it, over and out. But I would rather believe, listen to this, okay? I would rather believe that it's so inexplicably awesome that no one could ever describe it. I'd like to spend the rest of eternity without pain, stress, worry, greed, jealousy, hate, and just be all the same, enjoying every moment equally, the feeling of standing in warm sunshine with your eyes closed and a smile on your face without a care in the world. Yep, that's what I hope to have on the other side. Hebrews says she can have that hope. More than that, you can know with certainty that you have that hope. In 1 Peter chapter 1, we read, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. So what do we know about heaven? What do we know? Randy Alcorn has written a terrific book, a comprehensive study of heaven called, interestingly enough, Heaven. It's 488 pages long, has 46 chapters. It's a challenging read, but it's, 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 it's uh, very well done, uh, and you should read it if you get a chance. He, has, he covers dozens of things that we can know for sure about heaven from the Bible itself. I'm only going to cover four very briefly today, what we know for sure. First, Heaven is one of two very different eternal destinations. Heaven is one of two very different eternal destinations. Now, to even mention hell makes most of us somewhat uncomfortable. Theologian Peter Kreeft has written, For salvation to be good news, there must be bad news to be saved from. 
If all life's roads lead to the same place, it makes no ultimate difference which road we choose. But if they lead to opposite places, to infinite joy or infinite misery, to unimaginable glory or unimaginable tragedy, if these roads lead to destinations as really and objectively different as two cities or two different mathematical conclusions, then faith is a life and death issue. And our choice of roads is infinitely important. Here's something that's helped me as I think about this biblical teaching. I think it was C.S. Lewis once said, Jeff can confirm for me, uh, hell is heaven refused. That is, no one will be in hell because God sent them there. They're going to be in hell because they chose that destination for themselves. The Bible states clearly that heaven, eternal life, what we're talking about here, is the promised inheritance of those who trust and follow Jesus Christ. Because only his blood saves to the uttermost. He is the resurrection and the life. So heaven is one of two destinations. Secondly, we know that heaven is real. It's real. Now, when Hebrews compares the temple and its sacrifices, which it does in most of chapter 8 and 9, to what Jesus has done and is doing in the heavenly realm right now, he's telling us that heaven is a spiritual place and a real place. But it's not an imaginary place. Now, this is a little hard to wrap our heads around, but think of it this way. Which is more real, the house you live in with its wood and drywall and concrete or the love that inhabits that house to the people who dwell in it? Which is more real? Right? They're both real. And in fact, you could argue that the love that you can't grab and hold on to isn't tangible, is more real than the house itself. Right now, heaven exists as a spiritual realm. If I die today... Before the sun goes down, my spirit, my soul, will be in the presence of Jesus immediately in that spiritual realm. But at the end of all things, the Bible says, when Jesus returns, he will recreate the new heaven and new earth and then give me a new spiritual body in which to dwell with him forever. That leads us to the third thing we know for sure. We will have new spiritual bodies, new bodies. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul writes, For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is, when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies, and we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. For we will put on heavenly bodies. We will not be spirits without bodies. Now, what is a spiritual body? Sounds like an oxymoron. What's a spiritual body? Our best example is... Jesus' own resurrected body. He was recognizable. Disciples knew who he was. They recognized him. But he could eat and drink. But he was also very different. No longer limited by what we find ourselves limited by. Our spiritual bodies will be free from pain, free from disease, free from death itself. And in those spiritual bodies, we find the fourth thing we know for sure. That is, we will worship Christ, serve Christ, and rule with Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we read, But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor even the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. And in short, we will experience the life, the joy for which we were originally created in full. So here's the question Why does the author of the letter to the Hebrews want his first readers? these Jewish background believers going through a time of terrible persecution and suffering, why does he want them to know about their eternal inheritance? I want to tell a story to try to, il try to illustrate. Way back in 1985, a year before being called here as youth pastor, uh, my brother Joe and I led a six-week sports evangelism trip through Bolivia, of all places, in South America. Uh, it was about uh, six weeks or so, and just an amazing experience. I wish we'd had digital cameras then. Uh, I have very few pictures of the experience. But during, uh, we played games all across Bolivia, a, a, a fabulous place. At that time, the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere behind Haiti. But people were wonderful, so interesting. And we'd play games in villages and towns and encourage Christians and hand out literature and, uh, and share the gospel and so forth. And during the final week of the trip, we had a three-day stretch that I'll never forget. We were in the, in the region of Bolivia known as the Altiplano, 
uh, the high desert. It looked like this. Um, about 8,000 feet above sea level, uh, arid, cold, spectacularly beautiful, and stark all at the same time. Uh, the towns we visited there were inhabited almost exclusively by the Quechua indigenous people to the region. They were mining towns, mostly salt mines. Uh, we played a series of three games in three days, mostly in courts like this. Just people gathered around from the town, and often the entire village would show up. People who had never seen North Americans before would show up, just surround the village. It was really cool. Uh, and they'd never been exposed to the gospel, most of them. And that's what we were there to do. So we played a game outdoors in the wind and cold. Sometimes we had to wear long underwear underneath our uniforms because it was so cold in those arid places. Uh, and then we'd jump on a train after the game and, and drive all night in the train to the next place. Uh, sometimes without showering, without changing clothes, uh, sometimes without even a meal. Uh, we'd just jump on a ride to the next city. Sometimes we wouldn't have safe water to drink, so we'd drink Coca-Cola or Fanta Orange. For some reason, there's Fanta Orange everywhere in the world, but we'd drink Fanta Orange. So by the third night, imagine three days of doing this, by the third night, third game, third night, jumping on the train, still haven't showered, same clothes. Uh, it's cold, we're tired, we're hungry. Uh, it's, we're, we're just miserable, okay? We have one more all-night train ride ahead of us. And we're on the train, and it, it was so cold that night on the train that our, uh, we were in our sock feet. Actually, they f our socks froze to the floor of the train because the water condensed on the bottom of the train froze solid. It was so cold on the train. My brother and I sat in the same seat, and we unzipped sleeping bags, put them over ourselves like a cocoon. So we slept together for body heat just to stay warm on this train. And in the middle of the night, uh, cold, just in the train like this, I woke up kind of, I was in and out of consciousness, woke up to the sound of like a baby crying. All I could hear was like, <laughs> and then I realized it was my brother. It's a grown man. And that was the sound he was making in the middle of the night. It was just so, so miserable, so cold. Well, we get to our destination. It's a town called Oruru, Bolivia. It's outside of La Paz. You can look it up on the map. 3.30 in the morning. It's dark. It's cold. We're tired. We're hungry. Nobody's in a good mood. We get off the train. We manage to flag down a whole bunch of cabs to take us to our hotel, which we're sure is going to be another just desolate, cockroach infested, no hot water hotel. So my brother and I just told all the other players, guys, to get their luggage, to get in the, get in the first cabs and go ahead of us. But we weren't being generous. We were just bitter. We didn't go to the, want to go to the next hotel. So we're standing there in the cold, not speaking to each other. We're, we're just frustrated. And we get in our, our cab finally, and we pull up a few minutes later, and in the middle of the darkness, there's this, it was like a mirage. There's like a sixth floor, absolutely modern, neon lit hotel called Hotel Terminal. Okay, it's still there today. You can look it up. And it was like a full-blown holiday inn. We didn't expect that. And we got out of the, of the uh, cabs, and in the middle of the night, we can hear, coming from the hotel, the screams of our teammates who are already in the hot showers. They're yelling, there's hot water! <laughs> and so we ran inside the hotel, got our rooms, ran up, took our hot showers, and at five in the morning, went down to the kitchen and ordered steak and eggs for breakfast. We did that. Now, here's the point of that story. What if I made that trip again, knowing what I know now? What if we had three days, no food, uh, no showers, freezing stuck to the bottom of the, whimpering in the night? What if I made that trip again? Would knowing that hotel terminal is there at the end change the way I experienced those three days? You bet it would, absolutely. Absolutely. I'd be saying to the guys, hey guys, I know it's cold. I know this Fanta Orange isn't the best, but Hotel Terminal is coming. It's coming. It's right out there. It's right out there. You, can, you know it's coming. See, I think what Hebrews is telling us is, and telling its first readers, is that, yeah, life is hard. The world is a broken pay place. There's suffering and evil and pain and even death, but Jesus is greater He's greater because Jesus promises an eternal inheritance. And that certainty, the certainty of his promise, fills our days, however many more we have, with purpose and joy and hope. A certain hope. Will you bow with me as I close? Lord, thank you so much for your word today, for this letter written to a people living long ago who were fearful and confused and in many ways a lot like us. Thank you for your promise, for the certainty that your sacrifice was enough for my sin, that your salvation is complete and our, that our eternal inheritance is certain. It's in your name that we pray.